Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Sepa. Um, why can't I find my camera? I, I do have my mobile phone and uh, uh, it says doesn't show it. It, it shows um, uh, the micro link and then the three dots. There's the audio options report the problem and FAQs, but not the camera. Yes, I'm afraid. I think with the mobile, it doesn't work so well with the camera. So if you can try the button, at the very least, we can hear you uh, and we'll have a picture up. OK, OK. Good. So anyway, I'll, I'll be here. Thanks, Eva. Thanks. Great. So hopefully all the technical side of things is now working well. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all here to everybody in the room and indeed to all of our colleagues who are joining us online. Um, my name is Martin Porter. I'm executive chair of CISL in Brussels. Uh, and in that capacity, myself and our, my colleagues uh, around the room here and elsewhere are, are happy to uh, be able to help everybody launch a report which we have worked on with the Wuppertal Institute. And we have colleagues here who will talk about that today. Um, and for us to engage in a discussion which I think is extremely timely uh, on uh, the role of circularity, in particular in the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, and to debate how that act can be further strengthened, improved, enhanced, based on the sort of work that we have found uh, in our report. Um, to that end, I would like to say a couple of words of thanks in advance, first and foremost to our host, MEP Sarah Mathieu, on my left here, who is deeply involved in these discussions in the European Parliament, and we'll hear from her in just a second. So thank you in advance for uh, hosting this discussion. Um, and also to the We Mean Business uh, Coalition, uh, which has also been supportive of the work that we have undertaken uh, and is very actively involved in these issues, not just in a European, but a global context as well. Um, and the report, I'm pleased to say, is something that uh, has been uh, worked on assiduously by not just the Wuppertal Institute, who are the lead authors, but the task force, um, that is set up by the uh, Corporate Leaders Group Europe, um, which works on materials and products for circular economy and climate. This is the task force, which you can see explained very briefly in advance here. There are a number of leading companies involved in this, and we work together with them to try and find solutions to advance this agenda as rapidly and effectively as possible. Um, and we will hear from some of those uh, today as well as a range of other perspectives uh, from other stakeholders uh, in this discussion. So thank you to all of you. We're delighted that you've all been able to join us here today, both speakers uh, and participants. Um, and I think with that, I will just say a couple of words of housekeeping and house rules. It's obviously uh, a public meeting. Um, it is online, as you will have heard, and we will be recording it. So I hope uh, we can uh, trust that everybody is aware of that and we can speak freely uh, and use all the materials as a consequence. Um, for those of you in the room, um, if you would like to put a comment or a question once you have heard the, the various uh, points made, uh, please try and let me know just by raising your hand. I will have a colleague who is letting me know of any people online who are interested in doing the same and I'll try and include you uh, as well when we get to that stage. Um, and if you are in the room and would like to speak, there is a speaker in front of you. Please remember just to press the red button uh, so that you can be heard. And when you have finished speaking, turn it off. And I think for everybody, a brief introduction to who you are, uh, very brief, before you put your comment would be helpful to all of our uh, speakers, I'm sure. Um, with that, let me pass over to uh, MEP Mathieu and to ask her to offer a few words of context and introduction. So, 
Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And of course, thank you everyone uh, for joining us here in the room and of course also online. I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to host this event and of course the launch of your report on circularity and uh, critical raw materials. And I think it's really the perfect timing uh, to do so, to discuss these issues, because, well, uh, my colleagues and I in the Environmental Committee will be voting on our position when it comes to the CRM Act uh, tomorrow morning. And you might recall, uh, of course, that this proposal is really part of an industrial plan uh, of the Commission uh, to, uh, to go to a net zero age. Um, it was presented in February of, uh, of this year together, of course, with uh, the Net Zero uh, Industry Act. And I think that that really shows that industrial policy is really gaining traction uh, right now uh, in, our, uh, in our union. And of course, it's due to uh, the growing pressure of the geopolitical giants uh, like China, like the US, that have shown that we can't just uh, let market players sort out of uh, the economical transition that we need uh, to climate neutrality on their own. So for this work, um, I think we need coordination. We need very intense collaboration between the governments, between the economical actors, academia, the civil society, and of course, uh, the public at large. And I think it's particularly important when it comes to uh, the circular economy, because I really think it's, uh, it's key to achieve uh, the boost we need uh, to our resilience, uh, to increase our locally embedded employment, of course, and uh, to reduce environmental pressure on our planet. So this uh, CRM Act is not just a reaction uh, to the American Inflation Reduction Act. It's also the logical outcome, I would say, of the Commission's action plan on CRMs uh, that were already published uh, in 2020. And already when we were negotiating in the Parliament, uh, our reaction to that plan, I really argued for a very offensive and proactive strategy. One that is really centered around circularity, combined, of course, with uh, systemic shifts in our transport, in our energy, uh, and builds environmental sectors to mitigate really the expected uh, increase in demand. And I, I mentioned that because I feel uh, that mostly the political focus right now is really on the supply chain, on, on the supply supply side and much less i would say uh, on the on the demand side so the crm act um, itself and of course the justification uh, for profoundly shortening permitting uh, procedures and pushing now for new mining projects, uh, even in protected nature. I think that that reflects uh, this urge to secure new increased and uh, diversified supply. And yes, of course, we will need new resources. And of course, yes, it will take time for us to build an industrial ecosystem that is really based on deep circularity. But I think we really have to start this now and think long term. And, well, I have to admit that China, I think, understood that forward thinking quite well. Uh, I think it was Deng Xiaoping that already declared in the 1980s that the Middle East has oil, but China has rare earth metals. And I don't think it comes as a surprise in that sense uh, that China already built quite a robust industrial ecosystem uh, in green technologies in the recent decades the way uh, that it did. And I think that we should act similarly today when it comes to circularity and uh, the demand increase mitigation. I think that that way we can really move forward from framing uh, the energy transition as a threat uh, to geopolitical safety and the climate transition like it has been done uh, very often uh, right now. And we can really start appreciating and exploring the many underestimated uh, circularity uh, strategies that we really have at our disposal. And of course, that will reduce costs for businesses. Uh, it will dampen the price um, when it comes to the increases uh, for those resources. And of course, let's not also underestimate that there are huge co-benefits for citizens that really make them worth doing uh, anyway, like a longer uh, lifespan for consumer products, like more glo more uh, local uh, job opportunities in maintenance, in refurbishment, in reuse, like better air quality, like more and better public transport, uh, and so on. And I think that many of these mitigation proposals 
would be really very popular in Europe. Uh, a good example, for instance, is I think rural France, where you know people have literally been screaming uh, for such a long time for more and better public transport after really uh, years of uh, neglect and a lack of investment. So we need popular support uh, for the transition. Uh, let's not forget that already too many people are really questioning whether this new I would say gold rush on critical raw materials is really warranted. And, you know, some people come up to me and tell me that, well, Europe is really imposing these new extractions for the big fancy SUVs for the rich. They are often very heavily subsidized and, you know, people with very low incomes are still stuck in their old uh, petrol cars. So they get the downsides of it, uh, but they don't get the upsides. And I think on top of that, um, well, uh, we would be sacrificing really unique and protected areas. And as a result, uh, a lot of people and communities really risk uh, fighting tooth and nail to bury new projects and uh, with that also the EU climate policy. So I don't think that it's in the interest of the Green Deal, of our security of supply, or a thriving new circular industry to really have this focus uh, set alone uh, on uh, new mining and, uh, and new raw materials. So I think the big question is if the CRM Act, like it is proposed uh, by the Commission, is really delivering sufficiently. I don't think so. Uh, in short, I think a lot more will be needed, both in the Act itself and beyond. Uh, and I already mentioned that these faster uh, permitting procedures more extraction uh, here in Europe and elsewhere is really right now the main focus uh, of the Act. Um, but maybe let me just briefly touch on some of the issues that we did uh, improve, uh, hopefully when all goes well in the vote, of course, uh, tomorrow. So, um, for instance, the non-binding benchmark for recycling capacity. So in 2030, uh, this should reach 15% uh, of the total annual demand uh, for CRMs. I think it's a start, but it's really not enough. So what we have said and what we want to do is that we increase that capacity to at least 25%. And we're also asking for recycling targets uh, for CRMs in waste, just like we do, by the way, in the new uh, battery regulation. We also want to have 25% of CRM demands to be covered by secondary materials. So these extra measures should really stimulate, I think, the market development uh, for, for the recycled uh, CRMs, which for some CRMs right now, as you all know, they hardly exist today. In the final report, we also expect to vote uh, on a benchmark for mitigation uh, in the demand increase compared to a reference scenario, but was based on the projections uh, from the JRC. I think it's quite an innovation, uh, and I will hopefully uh, see some member states also seeing set up more creative actions uh, when it comes to the demand side, uh, of course. So uh, then there are the national programs on circularity. I think that they are quite vague, uh, to be honest, and they lack really tangible commitments uh, from member states uh, towards achieving the objectives. They will basically do as they please. Uh, that said, and without going too much into detail, we do, as, a, as an NV committee, add some extra elements there in their programs. The member states uh, will now include measures on reuse, on waste prevention, on the extension of the lifespan of products and so on. And uh, we also strengthen and speed up the measures on recycling, on recycled content, on permanent magnets, for instance. And we also think that the Commission uh, should propose collection and recycling targets uh, for CRMs in electrical uh, appliances, again, just like they have with a battery regulation. And on that note, I want to conclude by saying uh, we should really look beyond uh, the CRM Act, uh, as these measures are for the most part, of course, non-binding. So if we look, for instance, at the eco-design regulation, one of the flagship files, I would say, uh, on circularity that I'm also working on, I think that will be really a game changer in my view. It's eco-design requirements that will allow goods and CRMs to be dismantled, to be recycled, to be reused. Or, I mean, think of uh, the digital products passport, uh, of course, that will really provide crucial information 
on uh, the content of, uh, of a product. I think without all of that, uh, business cases for circularity will remain very hard or really impossible. And we should also look uh, at the upcoming changes uh, in the WEEE Directive, the End of Life Vehicles Directive, the Waste Shipment Regulation, where we're also uh, negotiating with the member states right now. And I mean, for instance, our team, when it comes to that, is really trying to ensure that uh, waste exports can only take place uh, if waste treatment in the destination uh, countries is really fully equivalent uh, to that of the EU, which I think uh, will probably limit exports and reduce leakage uh, of CRMs. So rather uh, beyond the CRM Act itself, I think that's where we will be able to adopt uh, some of the recommendations uh, presented uh, in the report today. Well, that's it for uh, for now. Um, I'd like to, uh, to give the floor uh, back. And uh, I think that is uh, now up to uh, Michael uh, of the Wuppertal Institute to really present the report. And I, uh, I look forward to, uh, to the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Setting the scene uh, perfectly for uh, Michael, as you said, to uh, to officially explain and launch the report, uh, which is called Embracing Circularity, a Pathway for Strengthening the Critical Raw Materials Act, um, which is now live. And I should say, if you are interested in tweeting about it during the meeting, uh, the hashtag is Embracing Circularity. Um, and uh, we'll make sure everyone uh, can see it online uh, and repeat that at the end. But to save you going online and looking at it yourselves, Michael will now lead us through the key points of it, and we'll then uh, turn to a discussion uh, after that. So, Michael, delighted to have you here, and over to you. Um, I don't see the... Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, it's a pleasure to work on the project, and now I want to give you a short overview. Um, of course, the report aims different things. It wants to improve the understanding about uh, current and future demand for critical raw materials and strategic raw materials as well in Europe. It wants to improve the understanding about key barriers to greater circularity concerning critical raw materials. And you want to demonstrate what policies and investments are required to make more circular approach work in practice. Therefore, the report addresses opportunities and challenges in regard to critical raw materials and the goals of the Critical Raw Materials Act. It points out solutions and recommendations to reach the set benchmarks. And for this, we use three different examples of critical raw materials, the system of bauxite, aluminium, and uh, magnesium, rare earth elements, and lithium. Please, next. Of course, there are different reasons for activities on critical raw materials. We have heard some of this before. Raw materials are essential for the EU economy as a whole, and especially for the green transition. The availability is increasing under pressure, what we can see over the last year. Uh, and the commodity market has been very volatile. Global supply and demand patterns have changed due to emerging markets and new technologies. The challenges related to commodities are interlinked and, affected, and affect policies in the areas of financial markets, development, trade, industry, and foreign affairs. And various political instruments are needed in order to address these challenges. Within the framework of the EU raw materials initiatives, it was decided to, uh, to build up a critical raw material list and, oops, and as a EU level and, and as one relevant instrument. Next. Well, this is a very well known list of critical raw materials. You all know this is a newest one from, from this year. Um, it was additionally extended and it's at the moment quite broad. Next, please. Of course, we have a number of EU policies and regulations. Uh, the EU has specific critical raw material relevant strategies and legislations. We have heard of some. 
the EU critical raw material action plan, conflicts mineral regulation, the EU critical raw materials act, and the list. And furthermore, a large number of other EU strategies that have an impact on the green transformation. Many of these strategies, especially for the circular economy, also have implication on the demand for critical raw materials. Next, please. But of course, not only the EU has strategies, there are many strategies outside the US as well. Similar strategies have been developed, especially in the US, UK, and Japan, and others as well, but this is the most relevant. But these strategies differ in detail, but not because of principal different goals, but especially due to different main industries, the country's own raw materials, and trade relations between countries. Next, please. Of course, here we see the four key objectives of the Critical Raw Materials Act. It's an own extraction, an own processing, recycling, and the diversification of supply. Next, please. Now we are going a little bit deeper. Um, building up own raw material extraction capacities is, of course, one of the goals. And it, the possibilities vary greatly for different raw materials. For example, for lithium, we have some possibilities to produce it inside the US, inside the EU, uh, for example, in Germany or in Spain, in Portugal. But, but the by far best deposits are outside the EU. Rare earth elements are nothing but rare. They are very widespread, and of course, they are also available in the EU. But the extraction in, of the reuse EU deposits is much more expensive than from other sources, and especially the heavy rare earth elements are only contained to a very small limit extent in EU deposits. The most relevant deposit for heavy rare earth elements is still by an obus in China, and the content in others is extremely low with some, some different situations in Greenland, perhaps. And of course, um, aluminium bauxite is not mined in in the EU, and the reason is quite simple, a bauxite is only built under tropical and subtropical conditions, so it cannot exist in Europe because it doesn't long last. Um, yes, next please. Um, another, another point is building up own raw material processing capacities. That is something that happens over a long time, but it's sometimes challenging as well especially at the moment because of high electricity prices or energy prices at all. We can see the situation at the aluminium industry as quite difficult, perhaps not in Norway, but it's outside the EU. But especially in, in Germany, the biggest um, primary smelter was closed um, because of costs. And uh, on the other hand, we have additionally more cost intensive and environmental and labor standard in the EU than in other regions, in many regions. Um, of course, we additionally have higher transport costs if you transport raw materials and not the products. Uh, this depends, of course, from the kind of raw materials and the amounts that we have to transport, but normally there's a difference. But nevertheless, and this is a quite difficult argument, higher cost can lead to innovation of processes such as energy savings. This is something that we can see in some of the metal industries, for example, that we have more pressure and more innovation, but it's still a risk to have more pressure for more innovation. Uh, we need to take it to account. Next, please. Well, of course, recycling is uh, the next possibility and critical raw material set has, a, uh, has set up a circular target of 15% recycled content by 2030. And of course, for some materials, this target has already been achieved, for example, for aluminium, for copper, for precious metals, um, we have reached it. And for others, it's quite unclear how to achieve the goal, for example, for rare earth elements or for lithium, perhaps not because we don't know how to recycle it, but additionally, because we have a very growing amount of materials so that we don't have the chance to get enough scrap to produce it as well. So it's a combination of two things. The way of recycling is not always clear, but also the amounts that you can recycle are not enough. Please, next. Diversification of supply is, of course, the next one. It's often possible, and sometimes it's practiced. It's possible, of course, as described for rare elements, lithium, and many others. But these are all our cases. 
and its practice in case of aluminium. Um, but of course, it depends on the existing deposits, and therefore it's not always possible in the same way. But it's connected with risk of higher cost and displacement of environmental and social impacts. And of course, some of the some of the focusing of uh, only specific deposit is a result of efficiency. Yes? We focused on specific um, iron ores because of the higher efficiency of processing, and we focused on specific bauxites because of a higher efficiency of processing this. Please next. Oh no, one step. Okay, and we have some interim conclusions before we go further. For the different strategies, there are different ways of implement implementation depending on the raw material. Some targets have already been achieved. Some are achievable. is used um, in different processes and products. Of course, a lifetime ex expansion as one extremely important aspect is site recycling. And for example, usage of, usage of waste streams that it was is described probably for, for the mining wastes in northern Sweden that contain rel relevant amounts of particular raw materials for other elements. For lithium, um, a substitution can occur where um, most lightweight batteries are not needed. And then others, other possibilities can be used as well. And the lifetime expansion is, of course, always an uh, important option. And recycling will be absolutely necessary because we know that the amount of lithium available is relatively limited. Next, please. Of course, we identified some re regulatory barriers for implement implementing CE practices. There's a waste leakage to outside the EU. We heard something about it. Um, sometimes a lack of policy signals to shift pre preferences from virgin to recycled materials, not specifically for critical raw materials, but in general, it's not always clear. So we have some restrictions of use of, of recycled materials, and it's not always in focus and some policy misalignment. Yes, it's not always clear what policy wants in different fields of policy politics. And of course, um, we have numberless, numerous technical challenges and limits of recycling, and this is only a very small number. Um, of course, we have a dynamically changing material composition in many products, so it's quite difficult to understand which material is, uh, is included in which product. It's always changing. Uh, we have a strongly increasing use of substances, so if we, we have a stock building, and we need for an effect, effective collection and separation of clean waste streams and more locally recycling infrastructure. That means not always every, that everything must be recycled locally, but it should be more locally. And of course, um, this can mean for aluminium, 
we need more material uniform, uniformity to work with us. For lithium, we have to handle a very wide range of inputs. For our earth elements, it's a very demanding and costly separation process. Next, please. And of course, we have some challenges for business adoption, change in business models, having a clear business cases, economic viability, volume requirements to be competitive, lack of value chain collaboration, and lack of information. It's quite often a problem between the stakeholder as a part of the value chain, protection of business knowledge, always a problem, and logistical challenges as well. We have some conclusion and recommendations from this, of course. Uh, we should implement a more comprehensive circular approach within the Critical Raw Material Act, rather than focusing only on recycling. Things like lifetime, lifetime expansion is also relevant. Efficiency is relevant. Uh, we should set a flexible approach toward circularity within the Critical Raw Material Act that recognizes the need for a case-by-case -case approach. Deploy forward-looking infrastructure to enable a system-wide circular economy. And next, set a clear overall vision on a European industrial strategy that combines circularity, carbon neutrality, and further sustainability aspects. Create a more environment, uh, environmental and socially sustainable supply chain by diversifying supply chains and promoting responsible mining practices. And implementing financial in incentives and support schemes to ensure factor the commercial viability of the shift towards green technologies. And with this, I come to the end. Thanks a lot, if you have any questions. Michael, thank you very much indeed. And we will, I'm sure, we'll have questions. We will have some reflections and observations uh, on this. I should say the report itself obviously goes into all of those areas in, in much more depth, and hopefully you'll all have a chance to dig into the detail um, after the meeting, if not during it. Um, and we, I think just for the purposes of this meeting, before we get into a substantive question and answer session, uh, if there are any questions of clarification or specific questions about what Michael has just said, if anyone has those now, then maybe we could take them. Otherwise, I suggest that we go to the reflections and responses from, from our invited guests and any others after, after that. But, I presume there are no questions of, of clarification. I don't see any, nothing online either. So with that, let me pass uh, to one of our uh, online uh, guests, Siopa. I hope you're still connected and can hear me, can hear us. Siopa. I can hear you. Uh, happy to join you uh, from Finland. I hope you can hear me. Great, we can hear you. For the benefit of those uh, not in the room, this is Sirpa Vietikainen, a member of the European Parliament, uh, someone who's worked on these issues for many years um, and um, is a member of the uh, EPP uh, group as well. So, um, Sirpa, uh, we look forward to hearing your reflections on what you've just heard. Well, uh, gladly, um, and I hope that I can set some hopes and wishes for you. Uh, for your future work, because um, unfortunately, I have to say I'm extremely uh, disappointed with this um, uh, uh, commission's proposal. And let me tell you why. First, if we uh, look, we would need to take a prolonged vision. That means uh, beyond the 30 years. And if you look the whole idea of circular economy, we know that we have more people, we have more goods, uh, we need a, uh, we have a longer, uh, <clears throat> shorter time span of the use of the goods and so forth. The story we know, but that all leads to the fact that we need tenfold resource efficiency in all of the goods. Uh, and services. So this is not a minor change. And then when the commission comes from this, uh, let's mine it and produce it ourselves, even though the circular uh, economy is part of it, it is based on this kind of a business as usual thinking that uh, uh, goes to way too low targets, both in the circularity, in recycling, plus then thinking the whole groups. Uh, I myself left some of the amendments there, and what I wish we could all push forward 
uh, here uh, in the report, and even more important than on the praxis of the businesses, is this kind of a thinking that first replays. We know uh, that uh, uh, sooner or later, even though we would have a European mining and uh, the existing moderate levels of circularity, we are going to run out of uh, uh, aluminium, we are going to run out of copper, we are going to run out of most of the critical raw materials. And at the same time, we know that there's a lot of new beautiful innovations on the pipeline already in the market, like uh, 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 salt batteries that are abundant material, uh, <clears throat> cheap and actually more effective that are already used uh, in, in some of the practices in, in China. They are on a research phase in, uh, phase in various parts of the world. And think if you do not start uh, strategically thinking where and how we have to replace critical, <clears throat> uh, critical, uh, uh, very hard mining, uh, problematic raw materials with some other types of the materials. This same goes with aluminium, not only lithium and salt batteries, where um, uh, quite a, a, a number of these solutions get, can be in the future uh, uh, used at based on the magnesium, or then these new composite materials where you can use the plastics from uh, recycling. So first think how you can replace something that is uh, critical with abundant and something that is environmentally harmful with something that is not. And think of the case that uh, the Finland, for example, will be filled with lithium uh, mining mines uh, after 10 or 15 years, when probably China is throwing in our markets the salt batteries, well, good for the uh, environment. And that's why it would be better to uh, to avoid this kind of a sunk investments and side uh, tracks that I'm afraid we are going to create a lot, uh, lot lots, lots with this kind of a thing. Then the second uh, point that uh, should be put there in place is the reuse. And the circularity would be put, uh, need to be put on the uh, full list. So instead of uh, talking about 15 or 20 or even 50% of a recycling, we should be talking about um, uh, 100% per in quotes, so 80% uh, uh, resource efficiency recycling rates uh before the 2040 and if you say it is impossible well i think that we destroy the planet sounds to be to me much more impossible uh, in in practice and then uh you should have sort of a this kind of environmental impact for, um, assessment first number one how you can replace if there's the possibility to in the longer run let's say five to ten years to do it invest on that. Then secondly, uh, show how much of the materials you can get on use by uh, effective uh, uh, recycling rates. And then only if the environmental impact shows, no, you can't manage uh, with the solar panels, uh, electric grids, so forth, without uh, opening the mines, you should get the uh, green light for uh, starting the mines. Then when we know that the mine especially, it's a bit different thing with the um, wind parks because actually you can build a wind park and then if it proves to be not that of a good idea, uh, there's always some harm done, but not a major harm. You can sort of uh, replace it or you can, uh, 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 you can restore it with some other types of the energy. But then again with the mine, no, you can't. It is this kind of a one um, the alternative uh, where, where you would need to have the precautionary principle, do it only if you can do it without harm. So instead of relaxing the environmental norms and consideration, you should tighten them up. Only then when you can, can have closed mines, that is the tunnel mines with uh, closed uh, uh, material use. <laughs> Sorry, so not to have the mining waste, 
and uh, full cleaning of the um, uh, mining water uh, waters and the waste uh, water treatment systems in place. Then you should use it. And then if you say it is okay too expensive, that means that uh, actually uh, the um, uh, the prices nowadays are artificially too low and you should wait until it is economically possible. Then if you look at uh, agreement and the principles there, then when you are doing this kind of a major changes like the mining events, you should improve the hearing and participation mechanisms. Yes, not weaken them. And the right for justice and right for courts. And so to me, it seems that uh, in, in, in uh, some of the most important parts, actually the commission thinking goes totally on the side track and is probably going to co cause more harm than, than good. And that uh, as well for the business and, and uh, economy. Last but not least, this kind of artificial two years time for the, uh, allowing the permitting and then you automatically would get the permits goes well in small um, uh, uh, things like uh, grids or antennas or uh, wind power, or solar power, but not in mining. You you never can do that, that you artificially make the consideration uh, shorter than uh, what it is. And uh, then you would get the permit if, 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 the, if that is not fair. So this is more than strange and is sort of a threatening the uh, environmental uh, justice, very, very core principle. So uh, sorry for being so critical this time, but maybe uh, being critical uh, with critical raw materials is right on place. And then again, if we get the question right this time and now, I think that actually designing out of the ways the core principle of circular economy, we can actually solve this issue. But if we do not do that, then it is going to the side track and noticing after five or 10 years that you are there and then sort of a redoing the same thing. And that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we just do not have the time. Thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, now I'm uh, turning my ears on again uh, with a uh, very high interest uh, for your discussions. Uh, Michael, to respond when we've had others with respect to what the findings of the report say about the uh, the ideas and the, the uh, suggestions that you've made. Uh, but we're also very lucky to, to have uh, George Moorsdorf from the European Commission, DG Grow, with us, who can give both, uh, I hope, reflections on the report itself and maybe some uh, responses to, to what Siopa has, has indicated in terms of ambition, uh, integration, uh, and how to make the, the Critical Raw Materials Act much more effective in the light with respect to what she is uh, stating. So the floor is yours, George. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thanks for organizing. Um, also, thanks to the um, to the authors um, for the great report. Um, I read it with a lot of interest. Um, I found uh, interesting, I mean, first of all, the summary of uh, what we have and what we have proposed, uh, but also um, the, the policy needs and um, especially also what businesses can already do because I find, um, I mean, sometimes it's uh, seen in a bit like simplistic way, good against evil, or um, it's a binary choice between virgin and um, recycled raw materials, but it's much more complex than that, of course. And there's a lot that industry already in the um, current regulatory context um, can do, improving logistics, um, have it, establishing closed loop uh, business models. Um, looking at the um, collection and um, high quality recycling. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting inspiration. Um, but then coming to um, to the regulatory side on which we certainly have to um, have to work. Um, so our Critical Raw Materials Act that we proposed um, in March um, certainly uh, tries to really put a strong focus on uh, circularity. Um, so we realize we will need these uh, critical and strategic raw materials uh, for the 
green and digital transition. So we will need a lot more um, unavoidably, um, even the most optimistic scenarios for substitution and maybe uh, behavior change, we will st still need a lot more. So I think there's no, no doubt um, that we will have to uh, produce more, also produce more in Europe. And within what we produce, um, we should, of course, try as much as possible um, to have that come from recycling or even better uh, reuse products. Um, so, so there uh, we fully agree um, on also all the criticism um, that we've just heard. Um, but we do believe that uh, a certain balance has to be, be struck and um, that even if we reduce our demand for primary raw materials um, as much as possible, we will need to uh, increase the share that comes from Europe for security reasons and also for reasons of us being relatively um, more sustainable in, in the way we produce these raw materials in Europe. Um, so what's in the, uh, in the proposal already um, is, first of all, the target. Um, for, the, for the first time, we, we set a, a target across all strategic raw materials. Um, we say 15%. I think what's more important than the exact number where we, see, we hear some discussions is, um, first of all, establishing this framework um, establishing a monitoring system so we can follow up and see where it advances and where it doesn't. And then we can look more precisely at uh, those areas. Um, we also provide a framework for national action because we realize um, that uh, while there's a lot of EU competencies, there's also a lot in terms of budgets, in terms of um, specific implementation that the member states do. And that's what we try to coordinate better um, through the national circularity strategies. Um, there's also a certain uh, waste hierarchy, as has been encouraged here um, already in the proposal. Um, of course, it can be beefed up, um, but we do look at uh, possibilities to uh, coordinate better the member state actions in terms of um, R&D investments into substitution, into new recycling technologies. Um, we really want to encourage member states uh, within the existing frameworks um, to establish um, better collection systems, which, um, as, as Michel has pointed out, uh, is really important to get this, um, this very concentrated input to have high quality recycling and not the downcycling we often see. Um, so deposit uh, return schemes um, can be an instrument there. Um, the, the power of public procurement, um, so green public procurement practices, is something that we want to see in these national circularity strategies um, and also um, promoting reuse through other measures. And then the third element in our proposal um, are these specific rules for two areas. And um, the first one is extractive waste, um, or also called mine tailings. Um, and I found it interesting also to see this example being cited uh, in the report um, of LKAB, who's recovering um, rare earth and phosphates um, from iron ore tailings. Um, so that's a great, um, great example. Um, what we want to do uh, from the regulatory side is make uh, more likely that those kinds of projects happen. What often um, holds them back is the lack of information. Um, so we want to establish a database across all of Europe um, where member state authorities and current operators uh, would be obliged to feed in um, their data on what, raw, what critical raw materials uh, are contained in, those, uh, in that mining waste. Um, and that hopefully will then lead to a lot of um, similar projects. And the second specific area is uh, permanent magnets. Um, also, um, I think mentioned in the report, at least in, in the sense that um, in many um, value chains, we see that there's a lack of uh, information being transmitted from the producer to the recycler. Um, and that is very much needed because um, each of the, the batteries, for example, but also permanent magnets um, has a very different composition and only by knowing precisely what's in there um, can we expect high quality um, recycling. So there's a lot of um, specific elements and of course um, open to any other good ideas that help us actually achieve um, these targets um, if they are set higher. Um, but at the same time also what um, what MEP uh, Mathieu has pointed out well, um, this Critical Raw Materials Act is not the only game in town. There's a lot of other legislation um, recently proposed uh, or more advanced in the legislative process. Eco-design, I think, is really the most important because it starts uh, where the most important decisions are taken, uh, namely in the design stage. It also uh, produces give this instrument, uh, the digital product passport, uh, to ensure that information reaches, reaches must 
much better the, um, the actors that actually um, rely on this information to recycle and reuse. Um, and, and so I think it's really important to, uh, to keep the focus even after potentially passing then the Raw Materials Act that over the next years we will be seeing a lot of uh, product specific legislation um, that we also need to have this, uh, let's say, supportive coalition for if we say we want higher uh, recycling targets or reduce uh, demand. Uh, we also have to give ourselves uh, the instruments uh, to do this. And this is not like top down regulation, uh, but this is really what uh, also the report shows that uh, ambitious businesses need this uh, support. Also, to mention the right to repair proposal, uh, the green claims, um, the end of life vehicles that, um, regulation that we've now proposed. Um, so really in all of those areas, those um, proposals set out much more specific uh, requirements uh, that would help achieve uh, the targets uh, that we set in the Raw Materials Act. Um, so I think uh, my message is here, let's really focus on all of those and uh, work to make those a success. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, yeah, once again thank for the, for the great discussion and the report. Thank you, George. I'm sure we'll come back to some of that uh, in, the, in the next round of comments. Um, but before we do, we'll hear from uh, another policy-making perspective uh, from Rafael Jaimes Contreras. I hope I've pronounced that sufficiently uh, well, um, who works at the Walloon Agency for Export uh, and is responsible for Industry and Society 5.0 Business Development and International Affairs, or close to that, hopefully. Um, so welcome. Look forward to hearing your reactions to this, and then we'll, we'll go back to MEP Mathieu. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to convey my appreciation to the panel organizer for their exceptional coordination effort, and Sarah Mathieu, a member of the uh, European Parliament for Belgium, shadow reporter of AMBAI Committee on the Critical Raw Materials Act uh, for us as uh, today, I will discuss in two key points uh, our reaction to the report on, uh, on enhancing circularity on critical raw materials act and our view for our uh, member states. Firstly, uh, regarding uh, the report on enhancing circularity, we believe it uh, highlights a substantial opportunity. Uh, indeed, uh, very few process uh, from circularity point of view are currently covered by a single European country, as supply chains are now interconnected by international trade. Therefore, the sourcing of critical materials become a matter of grave concern, uh, given their vital role in numerous modern technologies, industries, and by extension, our daily life. Uh, the connection between critical materials and the circular economy uh, has, has acquired significant acknowledgement across few regions of Europe, especially in Wallonia since uh, 2014. Uh, the concept of circularity has become a fundamental aspect in addressing the supply challenging challenge of critical materials. Uh, one strategy to fortify supply resilience uh, within the European unit is undoubtedly the transition to a circular economy. By optimizing the reuse and recycling of materials, uh, we can reduce the absolute demand for raw critical materials. And this strategy aligns uh, perfectly with wider objectives concerning sustainability and resource conservation. Subsequently, uh, a growing number of European metals producers uh, and manufacturing companies uh, are adopting the principles of circular economy uh, across their operation. However, it is crucial to acknowledge the inherent challenge. Recycling cannot meet 100% of the European Union demands for critical materials. And the process of often involve intricate technical and logistical complexities. Moreover, recycled uh, materials may not consistently uh, fulfill the precise quality or specification required for certain applications. For instance, 
the magnesium is a vital component in many aluminium alloys. While aluminium is often recycling, the process is not perfect, and some of the magnesium content is inevitable loss during recycling. This ne necessitates the addition of fresh magnesium to replace the loss content, thus contributing to a constant demand for material. Therefore, uh, while reuse may be preferable to recycling from a circular economy perspective, the requirement for virgin materials will continue into the foreseeable, foreseeable future. This ongoing uh, demand will necessitate international collaboration to ensure a resilient supply chain for critical materials. However, this is not the sole solution. A holistic approach integrating efficient circular practices such as designed with recycled materials, responsible sourcing and international collaboration is essential to effectively address this complex issue. The circular economy does not halt at our, our European linguistic boundaries, necessitating, among other things, legislative harmonization for the transportation of metallic waste and byproducts across national borders. The sourcing of critical materials is not merely about meeting current demand, but also ensuring. Uh, we have the resource required for future technological and sustainable advancement. Many of, the, of these critical materials have never been produced in the volumes now anticipated. Given the swift pace of technological advancement and the rising demand for sustainable technologies. We cannot source these materials in the necessary volume from recycling alone. Sample, because there has never been a requirement for such quantities in the past. Finally, and significantly, one of the crucial challenges associated with the critical raw materials is the issue of price volatility. Indeed, price volatility exerts a substantial influence on the cost of recycling. Secondly, setting up innovation partnership in line with current European policies, and in particular circular energy and digital transition to pursue a metallurgy of the future, based on the circular economy to promote the upcycling of materials and increase the selective collection and recovery of metal waste. However, the European Union could implement a stricter revision to the existing, existing waste shipment regulation, making it more challenging for scrap to be exported outside the European Union. Certainly, scrap materials often referred as, to as urban mined, mines are a, indeed a significant source of valuable raw materials. They are increasingly in demand particularly in regions with growing industrial sector that require vast quantities of such resources. This is the case. Several parts of the world, especially emerging economies, are indeed eager to acquire the European unit scrap for various obviously, obviously reasons. In the other hand, to develop and strengthen the collaborative and functional eco-design to incentive manufacturers to design products that, that are easier to recycle or reuse, reducing the overall environment impact. Finally, innovation is one of the priorities of European Union circular economy strategy. Moreover, the renewal process of the SMART specialization strategy 
lead to the identification and selection of strategic innovation areas for the regions in Europe. In Wallonia, for, in, for instance, one of them is dedicated to circular materials aims to achieving a Wallonia social and environmental objective by becoming Europe's recycling valley for technological materials. In terms of innovation and deployment of a truly circular economy by 2030. So, yes, there are challenges, but there are opportunities. Let's move together to cultivate a more competitive and sustainable Europe. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Well, we'll hear from uh, businesses their perspective on this as well, but I think that's a useful link. Um, one question actually that um, strikes me, given what you were saying about the demand um, for the foreseeable future could not be met um, without uh, these materials being mined or imported into the European Union. Have you any studies that look at the timing when we may get much closer to being able to satisfy that, if not fully? At what point in the future might that be possible when the stock is so large that we might have the majority, if not all, coming from uh, reuse and recycling of, of existing critical raw materials. Have you done any studies on that, or is that? Uh... Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry. We'll come to you. Yes, of course, we have some studies, uh, but the problem is the uh, high evolution, the quick evolution. So adapt the strategy it's not easy. Uh, uh, implement uh, new mines to obtain a new material resource is not easy because demand 10, uh, 15 years. Uh, recycling is an opportunity, but not now. Opportunity after 2030. So the problem is now, from now until 2030. Circular economy, clearly, we, we, we have the opportunity. The problem is uh, we have uh, the, the big companies have the, 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 the resource to implement innovation, to invest in re research, but the small companies don't have. And 90% of the companies in Europe is small and medium size. So we need mobilized funding for these uh, small and size companies in order to increase uh, circular economic activities. But the problem is, and finally, just to finish, a life cycle, life cycle assessment is between 20,000 and 30,000 euros. So small companies don't have the money for that. So this is a, 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 a problem now. Thank you. Well, we'll maybe get on to the SME uh, conundrum there in due course as well. Before I turn to uh, Sarah again, um, we have a couple of questions online. If anyone has another question to add, I thought I'd introduce these now so that you may be able to respond, and then we'll turn to Michael as well. Um, we have one question about whether if the EU is being open about looking for other suppliers, does that weaken the EU's position and make prices higher? Um, that's uh, from the Slovenian Business and Research Association in Brussels. Um, and uh, from somebody from the European Aluminium Association, European Aluminium, a question about how the parliament is reaching its views on the targets of 15%, 40% and so on. What's the, what's the, the logic or the rationale behind those, those targets, I guess? Um, so with those two additional questions, I think you've had quite a lot of uh, um, food for thought uh, so maybe I can pass back to you and then we'll turn back to Michal as well. Sarah. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Um, and indeed, a lot of, uh, of food for thought, I would say. Uh, perhaps to start with, uh, maybe um, a reaction, of course, to, uh, to what my colleague uh, Sirpa said uh, when it comes to uh, the, the, the speeding, of, of speeding up sorry, of, the, of the permitting uh, procedures. I think that she's absolutely right. Uh, in French, we uh, have an expression, c'est une uh, fausse bonne idée, 
you think uh, that this is actually going to uh, to speed up the process, but I think uh, it will be quite uh, on the contrary and that it can be actually quite uh, detrimental also uh, for public support. I think you will, with this smart, uh, this, uh, this, this speeding up of, uh, of permitting, you really risk uh, people just going to court uh, over it and being stuck uh, into a very long um, story there of, uh, of contention and etc. So I think we are not uh, doing ourselves any favors, uh, let alone uh, that it would be a good idea to, uh, to lessen um, our, uh, our requirements uh, when it comes to uh, treating this in the, in the best possible environmental and, and, and social way. Um, and maybe also to react to, uh, to what Raphael said uh, on the scrap. Uh, I think we're all quite aware uh, of, uh, of the issue, but also of the potential indeed of, uh, of urban mining uh, within the EU. And I really think, and of course we still have to, uh, we still have to, um, to convince the member states that this is the way to go, uh, because it's really the parliament uh, that has said, uh, we really need to strengthen um, the rules on the waste shipment directive in the sense that we are um, sure uh, that all of the waste, and that means also scrap metals, etc., are treated in a fully equivalent uh, manner. And I think that that will make a, a big difference uh, right now also to our um, circular and, um, and recycling uh, industries. But maybe to, uh, to go back a bit uh, to, uh, to the report itself, um, there's uh, one one of the recommendations in the report really says uh, we need a case-by-case -case, uh, approach uh, and avoid covering all the CRMs in a general sense. And I really agree there. Um, that's why, for instance, we uh, as a parliament are asking the Commission to come up uh, with a delegated act that really details uh, the recycling capacity and recycling from waste benchmark for each strategic uh, CRM separately. And I mean, in any case, they're quite uh, in indicative and not binding. So right now the act is not very prescriptive on, uh, and, and, and I do um, expect uh, some, some flexibility there in the future. I think the report also mentions, of course, the need for new infrastructure when it comes to collection uh, and recycling, um, says that the WEEE directive really provides very few incentives uh, right now when it comes to CRMs, and, and I completely agree, I think it's why we are also asking again the Commission to come up with legislative uh, proposals uh, and monitor on, on, on how much CRMs are actually being put uh, in the market uh, in electrical appliances. Um, the report also mentions this lack of uh, policy signals uh, when it comes to the switch uh, from virgin to, uh, to secondary, and indeed I think that's also really what I hear. Uh, when I'm talking to industry, for instance, and uh, luckily we have tools at place, uh, and indeed, for instance, within eco-design, the fact that we would be able to um, ask for certain uh, content targets when it comes to recycled uh, content, like we do in the batteries regulation, for instance, is a good way uh, to actually make sure that that, uh, that that economic infrastructure also follows and that it's actually worthwhile uh, recuperating them if you compare it uh, to, uh, to the raw materials. And well, um, it was mentioned, of course, when it comes to, uh, to the industrial strategies, um, I think right now it's been quite insufficient uh, when we're talking uh, circularity. Um, I think, well, uh, we've, we've, we've made a start uh, with, uh, with the net zero and, and the CRM, but really it should uh, just be the start. I think we are lacking this real coordination, this real framework, uh, both on an EU level uh, and on a national level. I mean, and again, if you talk to industry, it's important that we do this in a coordinated way. I mean, it doesn't make sense uh, to have certain circular or, or recycling facilities in every member state. I mean, that, uh, that needs to be much more in, in a coherent uh, strategy and, and framework. And maybe finally, I think, um, one of the big discussions uh, that we are, are, are yet to embark on, we have very clear goals uh, when it comes to, uh, to climate. Uh, we know exactly uh, where we want to, uh, to end up. And that is, of course, also a way of, of checking if our policies are actually working. 
And I mean, we don't have that uh, as of yet uh, when it comes to um, the reduction of our of our material uh, footprint. So I think there. Uh, that will be one of the, the big discussions, uh, if you ask me, uh, for the coming uh, term, for the coming commission to really come up uh, with a specific target uh, ahead. And I think it will help all of us to see uh, if we're actually going on the right path, uh, but also really to make sure that we have enough incentives there uh, to, uh, to, uh, to reach those targets. But yeah, thanks again uh, for, uh, for the report. I think it will really help us uh, in the discussions uh, that are still coming, uh, not just on CRM, uh, but also on a lot of other legislative texts uh, that are still uh, being, um, being negotiated as we speak. So um, yeah, I really appreciate the discussion and the, and the report, and I'm sure it will, uh, it will help us in the coming uh, weeks and months. Thank you. Um, and I think there's a there's a couple of points you mentioned that other reports that we have certainly done recently um, in this area highlight. So the difficulty of measuring uh, this whole area applies to critical raw materials as well as materials more generally. And without that, the degree to which we can set targets similar to climate targets uh, is more challenging. But that's uh, a clear area of further work that needs to be undertaken in relation to this as well. Um, but you also mentioned um, industrial strategy. Uh, and maybe if I can turn to Michal to, to, to maybe take a few of these points, you also indicated in the report areas linked to policy misalignment and policy signals not being sufficient. And if you could give a little bit more detail on some of that in relation to what you've heard, that may be interesting as well but there's a huge amount to go through and we have other speakers as well so uh you can pick off what you choose <laughs> oh thanks that makes things easier <laughs> this was not the first i want to do <laughs> well I, I think we easily can easily can um say that we want to have more recycling and additionally that we need more critical raw materials and this is one of the crucial points yes we need more of this critical raw materials but this has a result that the recycled content can be not high. And it's quite difficult to say when it will be high and can be high because we see it for other metals like aluminium and steel, extremely long established processes where we don't reach the 50% recycled content, yes? Because when I was born, we have been three and a half billion people and today we are eight billion and they all want to have material things. They will it's this growing demand for materials. And now we have a technology change so that we need much more of this critical raw materials additionally. And this leads to the problem that the recycling rate can be high, but the recycled content is still low. And I cannot see when it will end. It will end in principle if we have a steady stock society, but this is at the moment for this material is far away. Uh, we simulated for this, this for steel for perhaps 15 years for the EU commissions, but uh, yes, it needs a long time. So this is one of the main aspects that we have to keep in mind. Then we have another thing with recycling and the problems of recycling that are relevant from my perspective. Of course, during recycling, we lost materials. That's absolutely clear. Um, but sometimes it's quite helpful that we lose, lose materials. Because if you recycle a metal and you have all the alloys included, then you have a problem with the alloys. Because you don't have the quality you want to have. And so you can accumulate sometimes materials. Yes, we know the problem with copper and steel, and you can have others in other materials as well. So sometimes it's quite helpful to lose materials because it's a way of cleaning materials as well. To, to make it usable. So it's a, it's a tricky situation. Um, yes, and of course, then we discussed a little bit about substitution and of course, substitution of critical raw, raw materials is a re absolutely relevant issue. And we have to focus on this very intense. But of course, on the other hand, sometimes it's simply not so easy because the case of, we selected the case of lithium because of this unique um, it's a very unique material, yes? It's the lightest metal with the highest standard potential. These are very chemical terms, but this means this is in principle the best material for producing batteries, for lightweight batteries. And all other materials are necessarily less good, they are worse. Yes, and this is a principle of chemistry behind this. And 
therefore it's not so easy to say we have to substitute yes for some application it's possible especially for lithium if it's a stationary battery it's no problem yes then the weight is not the problem but if you have to transport it if you want to have a battery for a car or something like this then it must be lightweight and then it's quite difficult to avoid lithium these are some of the points I mentioned um, uh, the, the policy misalignment or the policy signals. That, that question has come up a number of times. Any other thoughts on that before we turn? Yes, um, not, not so many, not much more than I've told before. Yes, of course, sometimes the signals are going to different directions from different policies. Yes, we are going to have safe materials, safe products, and we want to have recycling. And both are in, 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 sometimes in opposition, so we need safe products. But sometimes, perhaps, we do too much. It can happen. Um, for example, it's still not allowed to use um, recycled glass for primary packaging of medicine. Yes, it's not a problem of critical raw materials. Yes, but it's a symbol <laughs> for a little bit of strange restriction because nothing will happen. Yes, and this is the same for all other recycled materials. It's not allowed in primary packaging of medicine. Um, not a very important point, it's a small amount, but things like this happen and uh, yes. Thank you. So with that, let's turn to some business perspectives. Uh, in the report, uh, you will have heard that there are a number of case studies, a number of practical uh, examples of businesses looking at the challenges and the opportunities in this, in this area. And we've got two representatives of companies involved uh, in that. I'm going to pass firstly to Celine uh, and then to, to Helga. I hope that's okay. And I, I guess there are three broad areas we'd like to um, sort of direct your comments on. Firstly, a little about uh, a little about the activities you're involved in that were covered in the case study, obviously. Um, secondly, what your views are on the proposal in the Critical Raw Materials Act, as we've heard many other comments uh, on that, where it could be improved, strengthened, uh, uh, help your businesses essentially achieve these uh, goals um, and then more broadly what else do we need to do to enhance circularity um, perhaps in line with what Siopa uh, was saying much more ambitiously uh, still so with those three broad questions uh, as I said uh, we'll turn to Celine Domecq who's director of public affairs uh, EU for Volvo cars um, and we'll hear from you first so the floor is yours Celine Thank you very much and thank you a lot for the invitation for today but also for the opportunity to contribute to the report and through the interviews. It was a very interesting experience for us. Um, and this report, I mean, we, we really welcome it and we, we can agree with most of the, of the recommendation made. Thanks for that. Maybe I will start by presenting very briefly how we see circularity at Volvo Cars and what we're trying to do about it. So we have three principles. The first one is to use less material. That's the first thing. Uh, and that's primary material, that's energy, and that's water. We need to reduce as much as possible the resources we need to make a car. Then uh, we want to eliminate waste and pollution from the production of the car. And finally, we want to, what we had to touch on already, um, Mrs. Mathieu, uh, grow a circular business. So change the, the kind of, of business model we have. And, and that's not an easy one. Um, if we start by the primary material, if we want to reduce it, we will still need some because you need to make the car out of something. And so the best thing would be to have recycled content for the cars as much as possible. The issue today is that it's not always uh, available uh, or not always available in the right, um, as you mentioned, in the right quality or at the right price as well. That has an impact. You know, if you have to choose between primary material, which is much cheaper than the recycled content, it's a tough business decision uh, where you go. All right, so uh, here we welcome the CRMA. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's good to have it. It's not the only act that is important, but it's really good to have it. And we really need to see, <clears throat> sorry, more done on recycling uh, in terms of, we have the stick in a way when you put the recycled content, mandatory recycled content, it's the signal for us, obviously. But then you also need the rest to be in place. So we really need to see more investment in recycling facilities in Europe. Um, and if, you, if we take the uh, automotive sector, actually the cars today are recycled to a very high level already. 
but the quality of what is recycled is very rarely reusable in a car. Uh, usually it goes to other applications, which is fine because it's not lost, but that means that if we want to reuse it, we need better quality of recycling. So that's really something that we need to see in Europe first. The other thing is, uh, and we mentioned a bit of it, refining processing in Europe. That's something that we don't do much today. Uh, most of it is done outside of Europe, principally in China. Uh, whether we actually reopen mines or, or you know, dig in Europe or not, we still need the processing here. Uh, because if we do have more mining in Europe, obviously it doesn't make sense to send it outside of Europe to have it processed and then back. I mean, from a sustainable perspective, it's, it's ridiculous. But even if we do not mine more in Europe, and that's a political decision to take, it's not for us, um, when you process, you also learn a lot about the materials, and so you improve your recycling. And there's a lot of knowledge which is gained currently outside of Europe, especially China, and that we are missing on. And that's something that needs to happen now. We cannot wait because, as was mentioned, I mean, opening a mine, it takes a really long time, and permitting should probably not be accelerated for these kind of processes because mining is very heavy. Um, but the refining, we need it today. So we really need to invest. That, that would be something we want to see more in the... Um, uh, promoted in Europe, definitely. Um, and then one of the difficulty as well, um, and it has been mentioned, some of the critical raw materials, we have a lot in our cars, but they are in very, very small quantities and spread throughout the vehicle. And when you want, and that's true for our sector, it's true for a lot of other sectors who use these critical raw materials. And when you want to recycle it, well, it's first complicated to find where it is, and because it's in such small quantities, it's usually very expensive to do it. So from the car industry, what, at least what we are doing with Volvo, we are trying to concentrate where we put them. So in terms of electronics, for example, we are going to try to centralize as much as possible, reduce cabling and so on and so forth, to make sure that you know where it is and it's easier to recycle because then it's in bigger quantities. That's one thing we can do. Uh, we can also try as much as possible to design our components to be single material components uh, to avoid, as you say, especially for aluminium, when you mix the different alloys, then it's more difficult for you to recycle and give us back good quality. So we can try to do that. And there, that comes to the tricky thing, because their legislation in a way can help, of course, and, and you're trying to do it with the uh, revision of the end-of-life vehicle, but the problem for us is that when you start putting really prescriptive requirements on the way we should do things, typically we do not like that so much because that's making innovation very complicated. I will give you an example which is not in the end of life, but in the battery regulation. The parliament was very keen on having uh, cells removable at, uh, well, no, that the battery could be repairable at cell level, that you could go up to the cell level for, for vehicle batteries, right? And we can understand why you want to do that, of course. But on the other hand, that completely kills the technology of gluing the cell to the body of the car. Uh, then you cannot remove it very easily. On the one hand, you increase circularity if you can change the cell, of course. We still have to see whether a battery which has a mix of new cells and already used cell is still as good as before. But apart from that, you cannot do that. But if you glue the cells, then your vehicle is much lighter. So it's more energy efficient and the battery works better and longer. So you have to balance, and that's the really tricky part. Uh, and that's, you know, when you say that there need to be more policy signals, yes, indeed, you need to help us with policy signals because Volvo cars, we're quite a small manufacturer. If we go and knock on the door of our suppliers and say, we need this much recycled content in our vehicles, they will say, yeah, well, not available, not possible. If legislation says it, and we say, well, yeah, but, you know, otherwise we don't buy it, then we get it. So we need this policy signal, but at the same time, we still need sufficient flexibility to be able to innovate, to be able to do things maybe differently from another manufacturer. And then we learn, and then we see which is best, and that's how you progress. So it's a tricky act. I do not have the answer to how to balance exactly, but we are very keen to be involved in the discussions on all these uh, um, policies that you mentioned, be it eco-design, be it ELEG, be it CRMA, to try to find this right balance that meets you know, social needs, environmental needs and business needs. Um, and maybe one last point that I have. No, I think I have covered the main points I wanted to say. I mean, we have a lot of, we see a lot of sticks from the industry in terms of regulation. We would like to see maybe a bit more carrots as well. And not necessarily directly for us as the car sector, but yes, by promoting more recycling, high quality recycling, 
uh, things like that, you help us indirectly, right? Um, and yes, one last thing, sorry. The, um, you mentioned the scrap urban mining. Either it can be shipped outside of Europe and that's a loss, but sometimes it's also today reused in, again, lower application. For example, when you make roads, you can use it uh, for road infrastructure. Once it's stuck in there, roads are not redone every day, right? So it's stuck there for years. And it's pity because you have critical materials in there that have not been used. So we would like to see, is it possible to stockpile this kind of, of waste that we cannot treat today? And when recycling has improved, because it's improving fast, but at the moment, it's, it's typically one or two industries or, or companies who are very good, but it's not big scale enough. So could we keep it on the side? And as soon as recycling improves, then push it back to get back the CRM and reuse it in higher value. And that's what you mentioned, you know, to, to keep the value high. That's extremely important to retain the value and not downgrade it. I think I've covered most of the points I wanted to make as an introduction. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Just one um, follow-up question. You, you quite right, you say this balance between uh, the incentives uh, that regulation can uh, give to stimulate the market and the degree of flexibility needed to, to give space for uh, individual innovation is, is a, a difficult one. Uh, you also then mentioned that there's a bit more stick than carrot, I think was the phrase. Uh, is that an, uh, with reference to financial support, so the type of industrial strategic support that's also uh, been debated well beyond critical raw materials, but is it also in relation to that that you're mentioning that? <clears throat> yeah, in a way, if we see other world region, you know, incentivizing certain things and we don't do it, we have to do it one way or another. It doesn't have to be money. Uh, it can be through regulation. It can be through, I mean, there's already plenty of money in the table in the EU. Sometimes not very easy to find it, uh, especially if you're a small uh, business that doesn't have the resources. So it can maybe be just that, you know, try to help the companies who want to use it to find it easier. It could be. We have to be open-minded and, and, you know, creative in a way of doing it. But regulation and, and making things like prohibiting things or, or forcing you to do things this way or that way, it's important. It's there for a reason. But we need to create the whole ecosystem around circularity. We won't do it on our own. Great. That's really um, very instructive. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to pass over to, to Helga uh, and the same three sets of questions to you. You know, an example of the work you're doing through the case study, uh, your views on the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, and then a broader question of how what, what else can and should uh, the EU be doing, particularly with respect to your business uh, and, and its challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here and for an <clears throat> interesting uh, report. Uh, I'm Helge Refsum. I <clears throat> sorry, represent uh, Hydro, which is uh, Europe's largest uh, aluminium uh, company. Uh, and we're now also investing in battery materials. So I, I work as a director of business development in the hydro batteries. And I'm also a board member of uh, Vyanode, who produces uh, synth synthetic uh, graphite, one of our investments. Um, Hydro is uh, headquartered in, in Norway, but we have 40% uh, of our uh, 33,000 employees uh, in Europe. Uh, and we have the commercial interests, both of course in aluminum and also in, uh, in battery materials. So what we're doing in battery materials um, is um, three main focus areas. We have uh, anode materials producing synthetic graphite, which I will speak more about uh, and was also mentioned as our uh, uh, case study. We do uh, recycling of uh, end-of-life uh, batteries. We have Europe's largest facility for crushing and sorting of, uh, of uh, battery, uh, EV batteries to uh, recover the materials. And lastly, we have uh, invested in uh, Lithium de France, who does uh, direct lithium extraction, which is a new technology to to uh, to avoid mining for uh, for lithium and um, and get the lithium directly from underwater brines where you also use the the heat from the water for district heating so i think our three growth pillars are also three examples of uh, truly sustainable ways of producing uh, new battery materials and i think that that's an approach that needs to be uh, taken because as it was mentioned we cannot rely only on uh, on recycling we need to find Truly really sustainable ways to produce also virgin materials for the green transition. So today I'll be speaking mostly about um, graphite and also a bit about uh, aluminum. And 
you might know uh, um, that graphite is uh, makes up about half of a battery cell. It's uh, in terms of uh, weight, it's a key component of all lithium ion batteries, irrespective of whether it's uh, LFP or NMC or, or various cathode chemistries. That also means that it's a significant part of the CO2 footprint of the of the battery and, and really a key component. Uh, there's no uh, production at scale, at the industrial scale we need of graphite in Europe uh, today. Uh, by 2030, we'll need uh, a million tons uh, annually or, or more, depending on which forecasts uh, you look at. Today, uh, Europe needs to import all of this. Uh, most of it comes from China. 90% of the graphite is produced in China today and, and not in a very uh, clean way. And you can um, you can produce graphite for uh, for battery applications in two main routes: the uh, synthetic graphite, which we do, and uh, natural graphite, which involves uh, mining and then uh, processing of that. And now, as uh, hydro, we are uh, we are working to address the challenges both of uh, local supply in Europe and also of sustainable supply of these. Uh, materials. So we are planning to, uh, to build um, a large-scale facility for production of synthetic graphite in Norway. And we were, last week, we, uh, we were awarded the 90 million euros from the EU Innovation Fund to support uh, those plans. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, synthetic graphite to our uh, stakeholders in, in Brussels and elsewhere, we often are met with uh, uh, two uh, counter arguments. Uh, one is that um, it's it's dirty. Um, uh, I can say it, it's certainly not. If you use modern technology like we have in Vinode, you reduce the um, the energy intensity, you increase the yield, and you uh, because of the closed furnace technology, you also reduce direct emissions. So compare, and when we couple that with using only renewable energy, we get a reduction of more than 90% of the CO2 footprint compared to importing this from, uh, from China. So it's uh, both in terms of self-sufficient and in terms of reducing CO2 footprint, this is, um, this is a key approach. The, the raw material we use is, uh, is coke. It's a byproduct from, uh, from uh, fossil um, fuel production or oil, oil refining. Uh, but the key difference is that we, we don't burn the, the coke, so it's not combusted, it's, it's not converted to CO2 in, in the process. It is, uh, it, it's converted to a, to a high-quality battery material, and it stays in the battery for, uh, for the duration of the, the life, and it can, of course, be recycled where, at, at the end of life. So it's an, a good example of an industrial synergy where we take a byproduct from uh, from the oil industry and we refine it to uh, to material needed for for the future. So uh, the synthetic graphite will contribute to uh, both lower CO2 footprint of uh, of, um, of the battery of uh, new cars. It will uh, also contribute to to self sufficiency of um, of Europe if we develop these factories in uh, in Europe uh, and. Um, and uh, going synthetic versus natural is, is a much faster route as you, you don't have to develop any new mines. And then to comment on uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, first I'd say that we as Hydro, we, we welcome uh, this act. We want to praise the Commission for ensuring a full value chain approach uh, all the way from mining through operations and then to uh, recycling. We're happy to see uh, different targets for the different steps of the value chain, from extraction, processing, and, and recycling benchmarks. Uh, the exact figures are, are less important than sort of the symbolic value of, of looking at the entire value chain. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier also that we need a case-by-case -case approach. I think also my introduction showing how we work in, in hydro batteries with with uh, different technologies based on the different materials. I think it's, it's important to get into the details and, uh, and look on a case by case. I think there are three main elements that I'd like to address on the Critical Raw Material mm -hmm. Act that we as, as Hydro would like to, uh, to improve. Um, first, it's, uh, we see now that the Council has added uh, aluminum to the list of strategic raw materials. We hope that that is passed into 
final legislation. Uh, aluminum is key for uh, all green technologies, including all the technologies listed in the Net Zero Industry Act. Uh, with the energy crisis that we have in Europe, 50% uh, of European uh, aluminum capacity has been uh, curtailed. This means that we are now importing much more uh, materials from um, from outside, and by that by that also importing a huge CO2 footprint, similar to uh, to synthetic uh, or, or graphite. We have a a much much higher footprint when we import this than when we uh, produce it in uh, produce it locally. Um, Hydro also last month produced the first uh, true zero aluminum uh, using recycled uh, aluminum and hydrogen as, as fuel. So we were the first to produce true uh, zero emission uh, aluminum. Uh, a second point uh, is that we are disappointed that only natural graphite is, uh, is mentioned in the act. We believe it should be just graphite so that we can uh, can have both synthetic and, uh, and natural graphite being uh, treated uh, equally. And, uh, and we believe that both um, all sources of graphite will be needed, both synthetic, uh, nat natural, and, and whatever we can, uh, can do of, uh, of recycling. The recycling of graphite is currently a very immature technology. So we would like to see, uh, see synthetic graphite being recognized alongside natural. And, uh, and lastly, we uh, we would like to see a distinguish uh, um, uh, in in reporting of uh, pre-consumer and post-consumer uh, scrap, uh, because the the industrial waste you have in, in pre-consumer scrap that will be handled by the industry in a, in any case. It, it has a high value and is uh, easy to recycle. And um, uh, whereas the, the post-consumer scrap is much harder to get hold of. Uh, and it's important that we we ad address those sources to uh, to be able to get the, the recycling uh, rates up uh, and uh, to avoid skewed incentives um, when calculating the the true uh, the true footprint of, of material because the pre-consumer uh, scrap uh, carries a footprint because it's produced from virgin materials whereas the post-consumer uh, should not carry a footprint. And then you, um, you, you risk greenwashing if you mix uh, this up. You also risk uh, importing uh, pre-consumed -pre scrap without assigning it the, the right footprint. So to conclude, we're, uh, we're very happy to see the uh, circularity being an important uh, part of the Critical Raw Materials Act. Uh, we hope to see uh, in increased recognition of the role of aluminum, synthetic graphite, and uh, end-of-life uh, recycling under the Act. Wonderful, thank you. And I presume, therefore, that the conclusions, as you said, of the, the report you support as well from that perspective, in addition to those broader comments about uh, the Act? Yes, 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 of course. So, we, so that we'll take that as a, an endorsement, uh, Michael. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions yet online. I just want to check if anyone would like to make a comment or a question here before we move on to our next uh, speaker. But uh, please just introduce yourself for the benefit of everyone else. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Teitgat at uh, Umicor. Umicor is a uh, materials technology and recycling company. So we are in the heart of what has been discussed here so far. Uh, I would like to, to make a short comment on, on one of the conclusions that Michael made in his report. So uh, the most, uh, the conclusion that I liked most was uh, the case-by-case -case approach, and that was uh, supported by uh, Mrs. Mathieu as well. Uh, I think indeed that we have to, to pay attention and, and to avoid uh, generalizing and, and good measures from one sector are not necessarily a good one in another sector. I would like to illustrate it with the recycled content uh, discussion that we have had this here as well. Uh, so in the battery regulation, and that's one of the focus areas for, for, my, uh, for myself and our business, um, we are producing cathode active materials and we do the recycling of batteries. So we can really make the closed loop and still we are not very happy with the, uh, with the recycled content targets in the battery regulation and why. Uh, some we see it already with customers today. They ask, okay, in the future will we need to have some targets, and so can you already provide it today? And can you do more? 
we say yes, but if there is no recycled material, how do we get more? And so there are two ways that we can offer. We say, okay, we can cannibalize on your second life uh, projects. Uh, instead of sending them to second life, we will recycle them, but that's not, not the right way. Uh, another is that we say, well, we also have a production units in, in, in China. We produce cathode material in China. There's much more recycling in China today than there is in, in Europe. And so we can provide you with materials from China. But that's also not what we want. We want to develop our European value chain. So I think that we have now to look very careful, carefully how we can avoid that uh, that recycling target, which we understand and, and it has, broadly speaking, uh, interesting ideas, but how to avoid that it would be uh, or achieve the opposite than what we want. Hmm? And so that means how to avoid cannibalizing on uh, Second Life and how to avoid that it would be an, a new dependency uh, of materials, namely <laughs> secondary materials from outside Europe. And so there, there are some concerns and, and we have to see how that general principle can be translated in something that's practical working and supporting other uh, policies as well. Thank you. Thank you. And is your um, idea that that would have to come as part of a broader industrial strategy or does it need a more specific response? Yeah, I think indeed that we general principles I agree, and we have to have general principles, uh, but we have them to translate them into practical things and, and, and measures that that really reflect all the values that we pursue. And, and a target as such, okay, we can work on it. Uh, the same with the recycled targets or the recycling targets, uh, which is 15, 20, 25 percent. But what does it mean for individual elements? For instance, for the precious metals and the PGMs, so the platinum group metals, we are achieving already 60 percent recycling, but that's not enough. Yeah. Whereas if you say, well, the global target, and if you do not specify uh, to the individual elements, Okay, then if you say, well, we need 25, what will happen is that you will focus on the bulk materials, that you will say, okay, we will we'll increase the recycling rate of copper of aluminum because that will increase the number. But what uh, PGMs, rhodium, that's expressed in kilograms, it's not expressed in tons. And so how will it contribute to, to more recycling? Okay, I think we have to look at it very granular. Yeah. Great, many thanks indeed. Um, we're now going to hopefully go online uh, and to hear Olivia Lazard um, from Carnegie Europe. Olivia, I can see you. Hopefully you can see us as well. Um, you've been very patient. You've listened to everything that's been said. You've uh, hopefully had a chance to read uh, the report as well. And we're very keen to hear your perspective uh, on both the report and anything else that you've, you've heard. So um, the floor is yours. Over to you. We can't hear her. Our technicians are working on it. Bear with us, Olivia. Perfect. I think it's working now. Yes? It is. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I have found the, the conversation to be really insightful and enlightening. And so I'd like to congratulate the organizers, but also all the participants, because it's one of the most insightful conversations that I've had the occasion to listen to on, um, on critical raw material circularity and uh, some of the dilemmas that we're facing. And that's the key thing that I'd like to focus on, because a lot of the interventions have indeed highlighted a number of different um, dilemmas that we're facing. So Sirpa mentioned something that I have found quite insightful. She said, we need to focus on the right questions. So I'd like to share the question that I think is the most important, which sort of, you know, puts the larger discussion that we're having into a larger light, which is essentially um, the following. How do we build an economic and political union that works towards economic performance that delivers on planetary boundaries, not just greenhouse gas reductions, emission reductions, that delivers on social contracts, and that delivers on geopolitical protection. And how do, the, do we do this in a way that helps to navigate the fact that we're about to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, a global warming compared to pre-industrial levels, and that we're 
very rapidly actually accelerating towards the two degree threshold. Technically, these objectives work at odds with each other in various ways. And the role of the Commission, the Parliament, the member states and citizens, as well as you know, the larger sort of constituencies of research and academia, is to find ways to reconcile these object objectives. And that's what we've been talking about in the last hour and a half. CRMs stand very much at the heart of the conundrums since they're the backbone of the energy transition. They're the backbone of the digital transition. They're also the backbone in a lot of ways of military capabilities that Europe needs to build as well in an open strategic autonomy sort of you know, trajectory considering the geopolitical environment, which is becoming less and less friendly and actually a lot more dangerous. But CRMs in terms of extraction, in terms of processing can be environmentally costly, capital intensive. In some places they can be socially taxing and um, very much ecologically intensive as well. Some actors are looking at CRMs very much as a new frontier of economic expansion. It's a new business opportunity in some ways, whereas some other actors are looking at them as a danger to their social and environmental fabrics, especially again, where they're exploited, where they're processed in some places, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is that we're having this conversation today because Europe is essentially 30 years late on the industrial strategy that was needed, that is needed, to deliver on mitigation strategies for the climate crisis, but also for a larger geopolitical context that necessitates essentially an industrial strategy um, to be competitive, to be protected, and to be um, to have an innovative sort of you know value proposition in a geopolitical and geoeconomic environment, which is quite risky at the moment. We're late on mining. Um, there's a lack of capital investments even today and you know even a year into the conversation around the CRMA um, and accelerating towards climate transition um, targets there's still very much of a lack of capital investment towards new mining projects that may help essentially to build up the sort of stocks from which to recycle there is a lack of technicality and technical knowledge around um, you know, mining and around technological sort of you know, innovation at scale within, um, within Europe, even though some have been, have been mentioned in this very uh, conversation. And there is a lack of economies of scale, particularly connecting you know, mining and processing, as was also mentioned. Um, there is, we're late essentially on circularity, as was mentioned as well. There is a lack of industrial ecosystems and, and you know, business case, which is not built up for recycling and for circularity um, within Europe, which does not necessarily provide you know, like those sort of um, incentives and the, and the carrots, as was also mentioned, that we need. So then that means that essentially what we have to do at the moment is to try and sort of look through these dilemmas and understand where Europe can indeed be competitive, where it can deliver on its own sort of economic, um, you know, sort of performance in a way that delivers on social contracts and planetary boundaries. And that helps to sort of compete with systems rivals in the form of China, Russia, but also, you know, in some respects, the US and other OECD economies. The CRMA is obviously one of the legislative and action-oriented elements of the EU. It's not the only one, as Raphael was mentioning. It sets a number of targets, but the key question today, and this is the part that you know, I've been partly missing in the conversation, is how to achieve those targets and how to refine a highly like, the, the sort of you know, industrial ecosystem is in a highly dynamic and volatile business, geopolitical, and biophysical environment. This is what we need to be talking about. So Sarah mentioned, for example, the fact that there needs to be delegated acts for mineral specificities. I think that this is a great idea to look exactly at where the you know, specific vulnerabilities are, and that needs to connect with the technological innovations that private business actors are looking at sort of developing, um, but also at where you know, like those sort of dependencies are located. There also needs to be, and that was not really discussed today, a number of different sort of coordinated task forces that connect industrial policy and research actors that also connect various industrial ecosystems, mining, processing, and circularity. For the moment, we don't really have very strong coordinated um, and strategic conversations asking the right questions 
putting the right timelines and really looking into what are today the um, sort of assets that private business actors, that policy um, actors can sort of pull together in order to bring Europe where it needs to be starting now, looking at the 2030 target and really looking also at how is the geopolitical and geoeconomic environment changing how fast is it going? Where are the sort of you know lame ducks of industrial policies potentially, and where are the true winners? And what kind of objectives do they deliver upon? For this, we're lucky to have you know some skeleton of um, sort of institutions or organizations. EA, the sort of EIT Raw Materials Association can, for example, serve as an incubator for a number of different coordinated and strategic conversations, as well as ecosystems of actors looking at what are the benchmarks, by when, for what purpose, and for what objectives, and also. Um, what are the de-risking and investment strategies on the part of states and on the commission that are necessary to help propel industrial innovation and again, you know, define, redefining the targets. There is something that also was not fully mentioned, which is the fact that we need at the moment to have ways to monitor which critical minerals are used for what type of sectors. And in particular, we need to fast track use of CRMs and recycled as well as you know, circular economies um, for the energy transition primarily. Because otherwise there is a risk essentially that the EU will embed its own sort of you know, um, dependencies from a geopolitical perspective, but also that it may miss the targets set for 2030, which would represent essentially a faltering on social contracts and constitutionally binding contracts, which will have a number of security repercussions, both regionally, domestically, but also geopolitically. There needs to be a set of investments into responsible mining, which is the backbone of the circularity aspect, notwithstanding all of the really good points that have been made. There have been a number of different studies that recognize and demonstrate essentially that mining is still going to be necessary for the next 10 to 15 years. So then the question, the question becomes, what is the type of responsible mining that Europe can invest into, not just in Europe, and this is the really important part that the CRMA is missing at the moment, but also outside of Europe. Because at the moment, the CRMA and a set of other legislative components are looking at energy security and European interests from a European perspective. But the reality is that European interests will only be met if we meet them along with the partners that are at the heart of the energy transition. So that requires essentially Europe, the European Union, to define a value proposition for geopolitical partners, particularly in the Global South, which are at the heart of this energy transition, to look at how do we build circularity across different frontiers and how do we invest into the type of responsible mining that is going to meet a number of different industrial standards for partners, but not just industrial standards that are going to meet interests from an ecological perspective. And this is the part again that is not being mentioned today. We are about, like, you know, the, the sort of industrial strategy is not just there to meet economic and geoeconomic purposes, but also to meet climate and ecological targets. And the reality is that water, which is key for the industrial strategy, is about to run amiss because of climate, um, sort of uh, global warming, but also because of other in, and you know anthropogenic activities that are sort of lessening the availability of water. So at the same time as investing into an industrial strategy, there is a need to invest into a regenerative strategy, both at home, thankfully we now have a nature restoration law, but also abroad. And this is going to create essentially a larger set of objectives within which the industrial strategy can function so as to actually get the sort of industrial strategy over the hump of global warming and over the hump of natural resource scarcity, but also to enshrine it into a much larger geopolitical proposition, which is going to connect the dots between mining, circularity, trying to deliver on industrial sort of strategies, but also on mitigation and adaptation strategies. And this is also the part where we will need a lot of attention over the type of conversations that are organized between public sector actors and private sector actors, because the reality is that private sector actors are gonna need to take an active part 
into adaptation strategies and regenerative strategies that will help to create a sort of global economic environment in which economies of scale, trade can actually take place. I'm probably already past my five minutes, so I'm going to end there. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to look um, what to answer them. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. I think you've um, made a number of points. I'm not going to, to try and recap, but um, a sense of urgency and a need of uh, strategic coordination comes through all of that very clearly. Um, and indeed, it links to, to other work that, that uh, CRSL has done uh, under the notion of competitive sustainability. How do you join these things together in a way where you're trying to achieve through industrial strategy as well as other things? a transition to full sustainability um, without trade-offs which are going to essentially make one or other of those things un unachievable or fail. Um, but with that, I think uh, we're running up against uh, the challenge of, uh, of our time. I'd like to just offer our speakers, Siopa online and anyone here, 30 seconds to leave a last thought on the topic of urgency. If there was one thing you would like everybody from the report to think of and to take away, now is your chance to do so. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up, I hope uh, very close to, if not exactly at half past. Um, Siopa, if you're online, you've got 30 seconds. If I don't hear you quickly, we'll pass to uh, somebody else. I don't hear you quickly. So um, I'm gonna pass to Raphael. Is there in 30 seconds anything that you particularly want to underline? Thank you very much. Uh, clearly, uh, Circular economy is a, is a big challenge. We need, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, I say that the uh, circular economy clearly for us is a very important step. It's a challenge, but we have a lot of opportunities and we need to move to this, uh, this uh, topic. Uh, we need collaboration inter regions. We need collaboration between, for example, Wallonia and the regions around Wallonia and all in Europe. This is very important. We need collaboration in terms of uh, legislation because <laughs> legislation for transport of waste, for example, is a very complicated. We need a, a work on industrial symbiosis. So uh, this is a, a very important aspect because we don't have a platform, European platform for industrial symbiosis, for example. So it's okay, but. I take collaboration as the key thing. Yes. Uh, George. So um, really interesting discussion, um, took a lot of notes and um, yeah, for me a takeaway is maybe like this uh, need for an integrated strategy, um, kind of let's say an industrial strategy for circularity. I think we have many building blocks, um, but maybe have to work on um, yeah, getting all sides right and also the investment and the carrots uh, maybe at some point. Great, so an integrated strategy, Celine. Yes, give us the political signal, but make sure at the same time that you, the, the industrial ecosystem is there for us to meet this, uh, this signal or these targets that you give us. That's what we need, an integrated approach. A great integrated approach again and the right signals. Elga. We need a case-by-case case case, uh, approach, uh, leveraging what we can do in Europe, like uh, synthetic graphite is a uh, Key neighbor uh, direct lithium ext extraction so that we can uh, get the, the critical materials from uh, the sources that are available uh, in Europe with minimal impact. Wonderful. So a case by case approach as well as an integrated strategic approach. Um, final word, any last reflections uh, from you, Sarah? Very difficult to do that in 30 seconds, honestly. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, but... you're allowed at least a minute. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think I agree uh, with uh, what Olivia says uh, when it comes to the sense of urgency. I think that we're really late uh, to the party. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that we should then just uh, just accept that and uh, and sit on our uh, sit on our backs. I think that there's a lot uh, that can be done when it comes to policy, of course, and we're doing it. But we still need to be uh, much more ambitious. On the same uh, time, I do see also from industry uh, a lot of innovation uh, and a lot of willingness. Uh, to really uh, make sure that we that we create uh, this industrial uh, ecosystem on circularity uh, as uh, as is needed, 
and of course indeed that also means uh, we still have to uh, to have a discussion on on carrots uh, i think that uh, will be one of the the big discussions uh, ahead as you all know uh, there was supposed to be a sovereignty fund uh, we got something called step uh, that is i think quite insufficient uh, if we really mean it, uh, that we want to reindustrialize uh, Europe. So I think in that sense, um, we will need uh, more ambition uh, coming from the policy side. Uh, we need to support, of course, the creation uh, of this uh, of this industrial uh, framework and ecosystem. And it's really also uh, up to us. And I think uh, the parliament will have to play a huge role because we haven't uh, convinced member states yet uh, to make sure that there's also carrots involved. Wonderful. So with that, uh, I wish you good luck with your, your votes uh, tomorrow and thereafter. Um, and a huge thank you, obviously, for hosting us uh, here today. Uh, I'd like a, a few other thank yous, obviously, to all of the speakers um, who have joined us here today, in particular to our colleagues, obviously, from the Wuppertal Institute, Michael and co. Um, it's been a pleasure, obviously, working with you, and I hope we'll continue to do more of the same. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined, uh, both uh, in the European Parliament here, but also online. Um, thank you in particular, obviously, from my point of view, to all my colleagues uh, who have worked uh, tirelessly on this over many weeks, if not months, to make sure that it worked uh, well. So many thanks to, to all of my colleagues as well. Um, and with that, I think uh, thank you to everybody. Please go online or scan the QR code that you can see uh, here to get the full report. Uh, it's worth reading cover to cover uh, it isn't thousands of pages, but it's long enough to give you much more detail than you've already heard, substantive though we have uh, been in our conversations. Um, and any feedback on it is very welcome, both to the Wuppertal Institute or to CRSL and the task force. Uh, we're very keen to, to remain in contact. And I think uh, one of the last comments was made about the need for, for continuous partnership and dialogue uh, between the public and private sectors, which we are very keen to continue uh, to facilitate. So many thanks. I wish you a good um, uh, rest of day uh, and hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you.